episode of Outside the Panel with your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Welcome everyone to the very first video episode of Outside the Panels. Yes, you've seen my lovely face on Definitive Crusaders, of course, the Comic Crusaders virtual con last month. This time around, OTP is going video. And for our very first guest, we have none other than Matthew Clickstein. Matthew, how's it going? Going fine. Thank you for having me, Johnny. I appreciate it. You are more than welcome. We're here to talk about um, the trade release of your book, You Are Obsolete. I have to say, you must have a camera in my house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm really hoping that a lot of the material that's in there, the storyline and, and some of the, the smaller plot points and themes are relatable uh, to a lot of people. I, I wanted very much for it to have a sense of the now and uh, a, a lot of pieces that are in there are based on things that I've gone through or people I know. I know a lot of people that kind of hover around the, the milieu that the, that the book explores uh, media and technology and uh, just generational shifts and just considering that kind of, uh, you know, impact to our culture. So um, I, I'm just glad that Aftershock let me do it at all. <laughs> well, Aftershock is the place to be for a book that kind of challenges so many different aspects. I think right. one of the good things I love about Aftershocks is the take, take an idea and they just run with it completely. Yes. No, they, they were they were extremely uh, freeing to me. I they, they really stand by their code uh, code of uh, of uh, creator driven uh, content, which is so important. I've worked with a lot of different companies in a lot of different mediums, and others have espoused the same aphorism there, but they don't really stand by it. Whereas with AfterShock, I felt very much in control of every little moment, every little nuance, things that are on people's shirts and background, uh, yeah. they were great. And they brought together a fantastic team of artists who helped with the production and uh, they were able to conjure up every little thing that I, was, that I was considering or thinking about. It was actually a very strange experience for me to move that fast because I'm used uh -huh. to film, documentary, books, even newspaper articles that could take weeks or in the case of movies yeah. and books, years. So to have something come up that quick within a couple of days sometimes was a really amazing experience for sure. So in case people have been living under a rock, which in today's world probably might have been to be fair. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what's the book about? You are obsolete. What, give, us the, give us the headlines. Uh, you know, the, the easiest explanation, the easiest concision would just be children of the corn with cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically that. Uh, it's essentially a story. Uh, it's also similar in some ways to Logan's Run um, yes, and movies book and books along those lines. Yeah, I, I really come from a world of sci-fi and horror of the 50s, 60s, 70s, a little bit of 80s. And that's, that's yeah. a lot of what I was playing with with this book. But basically, simply put, um, a disgraced young journalist who used to be quite prestigious, um, she uh, screws up uh, and uh, really has nowhere to go. She's invited, uh, very peculiarly enough, uh, to a small Eastern European island um, by an, an anonymous uh, caller, if you will. And once she gets there, she realizes that she's covering a story about the, the town, the little village's children have mm -hmm. developed an app for their cell phone that allows them to kill off anyone over 40, kind of Logan's Run style. So it's a little I'll bit of Logan's I'll, Run. I better leave now. I better leave now then. A <laughs> little bit of Logan's Run, a little bit of Children of the Corn, a little bit yeah. of Village of the Dam. We actually used a lot of screenshots and mm -hmm. imagery and iconography from Village of the Dam, both the John Carpenter new one and the, and the original classic from the 60s. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a big driving force and, and allowed us to kind of know what we were talking about because I love Village of the Dam, both versions. The book yeah. is excellent too, The Midwich Cuckoos. It's, it's a fantastic novel. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it yet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that was sort of the milieu we were playing in. Uh, Village of the Dam, Logan's Run, Children in the Corn. And then I kind of snuck in some things from you know uh, standards like 1984 and Fahrenheit 451. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've always been very interested in science fiction that um, is also addressing social issues and cultural issues. I grew up on Twilight Zone, mm -hmm. and of course, there's a lot of connections to Twilight Zone throughout New York, obviously, even the title and certain other uh, images and ideas and such. So, so it, you touch on like the social aspect, and I kind of I set you up right at the start by saying, "Camera in my house." This is how my Saturday night goes, right? So we have like family nights. So there's me, my wife. Uh, my stepdaughter, 
stepdaughter's girlfriend, and we all decide we're going to watch a movie. And yeah. it's a running joke. They never let me watch Batman. You know, they'll say, what do you want to watch? I'll say, Batman. They'll say, yeah, oh, 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 we'll watch some else. So they go and pick the movie, right? Yeah. And then 20 minutes in this god-awful movie, whatever it is we're watching, I look all across the room, and all three of them are on the phones. Yeah. I'm like, what's going on? What? You wanted to watch this? What's yeah. this? You know, if you were going to ignore the TV and just be on your phones, I'd put Batman on. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah. Cer- certain panels in this book, when I saw the kids on the phones, I was like, man, that is like, bang on. That is, I go to my brother's house and his kid plays up. It's like, there you go, there's a pod. There's, there's like an iPod or an iPad or whatever. It's like, boom, straight away. I was like, man, this is so, so bang on. But that's just like, you're absolutely right. It's one aspect because there's the disgraced journalist which I think will do anything to get back on top. Right. Is, yeah. is, me, is media that j- jaded now, do you think? Um, I don't know if, if, first of all, if we can, of course, categorize all yeah. media yeah, as one yeah. thing. That's important, too. Because I, I, I come from the world of media. A lot of my friends are in it. And obviously, the fourth estate's vital, especially right now. But yes, there's a lot that we've been doing, I, I think, as a society, and I think it's a good thing to investigate further Mm-hmm. Um, how media has been changing over the last years, how it was affected by new technology, mm-hmm. even the term itself, new media, and just media that's come out of the online realm, like Huffington yeah. Post, and Vice, and things of that nature, uh, BuzzFeed, and so forth. And I think it's important that we are w- very wary about where we're reading our information, how mm-hmm. we're getting it, the biases and, and, and the Perfect. motivations of the people behind it, including the people at the very top who own it all. Mm-hmm. Um, so certainly I'm very interested in that. But, you know, this is nothing new. Uh, you know, anyone who's a fan of Noam Chomsky is a big one, obviously. Or even going all the way back to Upton Sinclair, the writer of The Jungle, which was such an important book as far as how food and meat was handled in this country and labor and whatnot. He actually wrote a book about media as far back as the 1920s, kind of mm-hmm. like The Jungle, but with media called The Brass Check, which I also highly recommend. So I, I certainly wanted to play uh, with a lot of those elements. Again, to keep the, the story as topical, and as vital as, as I can make it. And you're right, I, I, I'm dealing with new technology and the kids always on the cell phone, but at the same time, I'm dealing with kind of how media has changed over the years through the lens of the main character. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, that was also a, a stylistic story choice. Oh. I wanted to obviously um, you know, integrate in there an unreliable narrator, narrator and someone who you, you feel like you have some credibility there, you feel like there's some authenticity. She's a prestigious journalist and so forth, but also she was disgraced at one point. So that becomes a little bit hazy. And as the story develops and she's telling her story, um, we get a sense that we can't always believe everything she says. And she's even very upfront about that. She says, hey, I, I'm no angel. And clearly she has a drinking problem. And I wanted to make her a very three-dimensional person. And to me, that, that A, just made the story more interesting, but B, I think brought in a little bit more fear. I really wanted there to be a sense of who's in charge here, who's driving the bus, we can't even trust the narrator. Um, so that I, I, I was hoping that would connect with the readers like yourself when you're talking about this night with your, with your stepchildren and, and their friends um, and make them say, gosh, I, I can't even trust what, what the story is telling me right now. So yeah. to me, it was just a way to, to make it more engaging. I hope, I hope that worked. <laughs> oh, it, it worked perfectly because you're reading the book and because you've got that first person narrator and she's telling the story, you automatically want to buy into what she said. Exactly. But then as the panels become more and more, you get into her life, you, you find yeah. out she's got a drink problem. She's got a drug problem. She might even have a sex problem. She's right. got lots of issues, right? Yeah. So it was interesting when you said that the, from a journalistic point of view and, and media, how you look through somebody's lens. Right. And when you, when you take a step back, you just hold that thought, look back at this book. It's hard to see where there's a good guy. Right. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that I really like about uh, this is my first comic book series. And uh, truthfully, as a kid, even I was never really that into comic books, per se. I've always been very interested in the subculture, the community of comic books. I love watching documentaries and reading uh-huh. about Stan Lee and Kirby and Alan Moore. And, but but for me, the, where I really connect is with the underground comics on a, on a more visceral level and I've, I've been a huge fan of you know the standards again people like Robert Crumb and uh, others along those lines Daniel Klaus and so forth um, and even some people I've gotten a chance to work with like Johnny Ryan um, I love Ivan Brunetti Shannon Wheeler of too much coffee man fame but so I've, I've always really connected with the undergrounds and what I like about them that they do such a good job of, especially Robert Crumb 
um, is a lot of times there are no villains, there are no heroes, everyone's kind of comical, everything's sort of absurdist. We, we, there's a similar tone in, in some of the better episodes of The Simpsons or South Park, um, a lot of really great satire. And so, you know, that's, that's what I grew up on a lot of this material. And so I wanted to bring that in there as well, where you're connecting with some of the characters just because you can't help yourself, but also you're always wondering uh, how authentic are they? Can you trust them? How likable are they? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I really wanted to play with people's emotions while they're reading the story. You're kind of connecting with one character, but then that character turns out to be someone that you didn't think. Yeah. Would be. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it goes back even, I, I grew up also very much on Stephen King's novels. Okay. And I think that Stephen King did an excellent job of that, uh, particularly with The Stand. If you've ever read The Stand, I mean, it's 1,200 pages and characters come, they die, you're following them, and they, then they become treasonous and there's alliances that are, are fostered and forged and then destroyed. And I just, I really particularly love The Stand or another one of his that a lot of people don't talk about often is Needful Things. And he does the same thing there where you're just, you're never really sure who the characters are, even some of the ones that seem like they're the good guys turn out to be the bad guys or whatever it might be. And I, I find that to be a very uh, captivating way of telling a story. And I, I wanted to play with that with you or obsolete. Yeah. Yeah, it, it absolutely works. It absolutely works all the way through. It's kind of, yeah, the focus is on the kids and, yeah. and the way that they, they interact with each other. And of course, how they interact with the adults, that's kind of like the forefront, but it's, it's the dynamic around them. Right. And you know, yeah, it's, it's and, and you know that everybody's. If, I've probably been a bit harsh. There is a there is a good there's a good guy in there. Yeah. I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm right, gonna, right, yeah, yeah, go and buy go and buy the damn book, man. Go yeah, 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 but yeah. Oh, that's right. Buy your obsolete. Yeah, I'm not telling you anything else. Just buy the damn book. Um, and I think that character's motives are genuine. Right. And I think there's only, I think there's only that one person that has that genuineness mm -hmm. about them. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So this is your first comic book. It is. Right? So you're self self appointed, not a huge fan of comics when you were a kid. Right. <laughs> Sorry, so, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I read, I read, I, I did, I did keep up with the Red and Stimpy comics. I don't know if that, uh, okay, that counts. Cool, yeah. like the kid, obviously. So, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> So, you know what's funny though? I, I, I will say, I know you're going with this, but I just have to say, because I've been talking about this with a few other people. I, I did, like I said, I've always been very interested in the co in comic books as a culture and the uh -huh. people behind it. But even as a kid, I actually would hang out at comic book stores a lot, even though I wasn't necessarily into comic book stores. And, you know, it was just where people like me who like to read, you know, it was yeah. the usual story. Yeah. We like to read or a little weirder or whatever it is. We would just go there after school. It was our hangout. And, you know, there were the older kids there who were still kind of nerdy and weird and pimply, but you thought they were so cool because they were older. <laughs> they, you know, probably in their real lives, they were, like, getting beaten up by the kids at school. But at the comic book store, they ruled. Yeah, and they, they were king like, of the nerds. Like, yeah, and, and honestly, like, I learned a lot about, like, punk rock music and different yeah. art and movies and just talking with them because I would be, you know, 10, 11 years old and hanging out with all these 15 and 16-year-olds. And um, they, you know, they did know a lot about music and movies and things like that. It would be like hanging out at a record store or something. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did, I did hang around a lot of the comic book people. Right. Even totally if I wasn't so. Totally so what made you think of this as a comic book then? Because if you've got, you've got yeah. history in films and documentaries and yeah. stuff, what, why the jump? Why think, well, because I mean, Netflix are doing some great, they're doing some great little shows, aren't they? You know, not, they don't have to be those some like... Are, some are good, some are, yeah. yeah. yeah I like Black Mirror. Those lot. huge like season after season yeah. after season after season. But yeah. there are some, some really clever little shows if you go look yeah. at I, now I, I actually really liked BoJack Horseman a lot. BoJack okay. Horseman, I thought, cool. was fantastic, really smart. It was one of the... It's, it's honestly a little hard for me to watch newer television. I've, I've kind of checked out of television after like the 2000s as elitist or whatever as that might sound. This is how it feels. Uh -huh. but, but BoJack Horseman was one series that I really connected with right away and kept watching and, and would, would go back to and watch and, and cool. keep up with just because I wanted to know what was going on. I, I really, really enjoyed BoJack Horseman. I felt like I was glad that that, that kind of material can still get out in yeah. a kind of mainstream way, um, even though it started at Netflix when Netflix was first really burgeoning as a, as a streaming yeah. service. Um, so I don't know if they would necessarily bring on a show like that today. Um, 
but uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. There's other options now, isn't there? There's, there's Netflix, yeah. there's Amazon, there's Apple, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So why a comic book and not a TV? Show? Yeah. Simply put, they won the they 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 won the property. I, I had originally developed it as an idea as a film, uh -huh. um, and I pitched it around to a few people I know in the industry. And everybody gave me really great feedback. I actually started with this three-page confessional that I wrote from Lila's perspective, the protagonist of You Are Obsolete. It just kind of poured out of my head, um, and I really liked it. And it was a nice little three-page short story that told basically the entire narrative in Lila's voice with a little bit of her nuance and, uh -huh. and everything that was there. It had that edge and spin to it. So I, I pitched that around to friends. Everyone really liked it. I got some fantastic feedback, but it just wasn't happening, and I really wanted something to happen soon because of how topical and I feel how relevant the material is. I wanted it out now. I didn't want to have to wait you know, a few years as sometimes happens with film and development. Um, and I, have, I do have some friends in the comic book industry uh, and they all say, you know, this would make a great book. You should maybe look into doing it as a comic. And a, one, uh, one or two of them connected me to Aftershock. I talked with Mike uh -huh. Marks over there, the executive editor over there. He flipped over the idea. Uh, he passed the little three page short story around everybody, said everybody loved it. Um, and we got started pretty quick, actually. It was, a, it was actually a very fast process. I don't even think I talked to any of the other companies. I think it was immediately Aftershock. They immediately loved it. And they actually yeah, sent me, they, they sent me sample scripts of comics so I could kind of learn the language and how to oh, do it. Because I was so green, I didn't even know how to write one. But what was nice is that, as, as you probably know, or a lot of your listeners or viewers know, um, I, uh, it's, it, it, the, the language is very sim uh, similar to cinema. So I would be talking about, you know, tight shots and wide angles and canted uh -huh. angles. And I, I, I tend to write in a very cinematic visual way anyway. So it was actually very easy for me to translate over to comics. And I had a blast writing the, the five scripts for Your Obsolete, the five issues this was one of the most fun times I've had in, in any kind of writing field in a very long time. Like it brought me back to when I was a kid in high school or junior high school. And I was writing just for fun because now it's all, you know, for money and for publication yeah. or not this was just i got to sit down and write and it was so much fun i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed I've, got, it. I've got to say some of that uh, cinematography stuff must have sh shone through i see so many comic books um from experienced writers as well as some newbies coming in and it's kind of the nine panel structure right. or it's this it's that the for a for a book that is predominantly a talking book yeah rabbit yeah. ears there talking yeah. book um there's a lot of pace to it right yeah mm -hmm. so that really shows in the, the various camera angles that you've used and and that's sort of the, the way that the characters are portrayed in the panel because it's right. not yeah no I, I i very much wanted to tell a lot of story with the way that the uh the, the panels were composed and those tableaus and evgeny um my the the, the person who's drawing it all he did such a fantastic job of uh, taking what it was I would write down and, and turning it into what, exactly what I wanted it to be. And just if we were above the characters with, you know, birds flying by and whatnot, I mean, he he really put that all together. And I was so excited to see. I, I felt very much like I was like a director and he was my camera guy. And I mean, it was excellent. I and mean, he, he works so fast and he's so meticulous mm -hmm. that, again, it made it a very, very joyful process. I mean, we really had almost no problems at all through the whole creative experience of, of doing all five issues. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted, obviously there's a lot of talking, most of it is her voiceover and that kind of thing. But because of that, I wanted it to have a style and I didn't want people to get bored. The other thing I think that's important too, is, and I brought this up before, because I am new to comics, both as a writer, but also someone as a consumer, I, I didn't know what the rules are. And there were honestly <laughs> times where I was not sure if we could even do certain things I wanted to do. Uh -huh. And I would actually talk to my editors and say, can we even do that? Is that possible? I'll tell you this right now, Johnny, I'm, I'm, I, you, you, you know, no spoiler alerts or anything, but like the entire issue four, the way that we put issue four together, I honestly thought they were going to ask me to rewrite the entire script. <laughs> I just assumed we wouldn't be able to do that because it's a very unique, that, that particular issue four is my favorite. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it's almost part of a, it's almost a dream sequence of sort. And I just, I, I honestly didn't, I, I thought that they were going to tell me to rewrite it. I thought that was going to be the one time they were going to say, Matt, just, you've gone too far this time. We can't do this. And instead, not only did they do it almost exactly how I wanted it, but they actually, they ameliorated it with things that I, I really didn't think we could do. I mean, they were changing up how the lettering was done. And I mean, it was really fun. 
So, so that was great. And, and again, I, I give kudos to Aftershock. Um, they, they were such great supporters of everything I did. And it was one of the better creative experiences I've had of like 20 plus mm -hmm. years uh, doing mm -hmm. different productions and writing, whatever it is. So we'll give some shout outs. Um, so um, I can't, I'm terrible with names. Sorry. So art was provided by Eugeny. Evgeny. Yeah, I actually don't know how to pronounce his last name myself. But well, Evgeny Boryov. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Apologies. If anyone listens yeah, to all the other podcasts, yeah. you know I yeah. get it. Yeah. He's actually, I believe he's actually in Russia or something. I actually never directly spoke with him. It was all done through, um, through my editors, Christina mm -hmm. Harrington and Mike Marks. And I think they were actually talking with him through like a translator or something. Because I would sometimes see some of the threads. So I think he's like the real deal, like somewhere in Russia, just like oh, okay. illustrating all these books. And, but yeah, so anyway. So you've got colorists, you've got a, a plethora. You've got Lauren Arif. Pippa Borland and Francesca, is that Torelli on issues one through four? Why did you change your colors? Colors on issue five. Uh, I know that Lauren did a lot of the color uh, coloring there. Um, I actually don't know um, okay. the way that aftershock at least works. I was really always just dealing with my editors, Christina and okay. Mike, and they would kind of relay what I wanted done to the artists. So. Okay. Um, I never actually spoke with any of them. I did meet Lauren at New York Comic Con just because I went there for some other things. And uh, she happened to be there at one of the parties and we met and it, it was just sort of an accident. It was great meeting her and talking to her. And, and, hey, I work for you. That's right. Yeah, you did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah, I was like, oh, you work on my comic. Oh, nice to meet you. Give her a hug. And, oh, you're you know, the yeah. guy that put this in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As I can tell people, I was just the writer. I was just the writer creator. I, what, what Aftershock did with it, I don't know. But yeah, so I, I have no idea some yeah. of those internal logistics, to be perfectly blunt, but yeah. I was pleased. But I think all the artists did a fantastic job. I really did. And I know, I know that um, some of my, my friends in the comics industry, as soon as I told them that Andy Clark was going to be doing the first cover and some of the other covers, they were like, oh, my God, they're, they're getting you one of the top dogs. And so, um, you know, again, I'm learning still a lot. But I guess Andy is, is really up there. And, and, and he did a fantastic job. I mean, the covers are gorgeous. Um, they really blew me away. I just felt very grateful and lucky that I got to be part of this process. And that I was kind of steering the ship, so to speak. But Mike and Christine and the Aftershock people were there to, to make sure that I didn't crash the, the boat into any glaciers or anything like that. Um, I'll give a shout out. You mentioned letters. Simon Boland, the uh, letterer. Simon's done a lot of work on Dynamite as well as Aftershock. So, again, um, a lot of people always forget letters. I, I'm not that guy. So, kudos. <laughs> yeah. you know, well done for all that round. I found it, I was reading the book, um, I was doing the research reading the book the, the other night, kind of going over it a couple of times just so I got it in my head right. Mm -hmm. And there was, I had a period of ironic realization. Yeah. Because it's like, it's a book about technology and how it infl infiltrates our life. And I'm thinking, I'm reading this on my Surface Pro. Right. And then we're going to use Zoom to do the interview. I'm yeah. like, um, Am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution? I don't, I don't know which one is it. <laughs> yeah, no, we, that was obviously something that came up quite a lot, especially when we would we were having meetings early on about how we would do marketing and promotion, and we were kind of talking about you know how are we going to do a, a social media push with a book that's so explicitly against <laughs> new technology and social media. I mean, it's about how that stuff is destroying our brains and everything. And meanwhile, we're using that. What, you know, look, you, it's like anything else. You have to walk the line and do the best you can. I mean, I love a good hamburger as much as the next person, um, but you know, I'm not gonna have McDonald's every night. And uh, you know, it's nice to have a piece of chocolate cake once in a while, but you're not gonna eat an entire cake every day. So I think it's finding, that moderation. Yeah. Um, even right now, for example, uh, you know, my wife and I are, are not really very engaged in online media um, or, or, or a lot of new tech ourselves. We listen to record players, we read actual books and so forth, but we still have to do things like this every now and then. I have a lot yeah. of meetings this way over Zoom, obviously, right now. We do sometimes watch some things on streaming because, hey, you know, that's where you see stuff now. Um, but we do things also like we'll have screenless Saturdays or screenless Sundays. Yeah. So we'll literally keep our phones off. We won't turn on the computer at all. Um, yeah. Sometimes that's a little hard for me if I have deadlines or whatnot. But, uh, you know, we'll just, those, those days, we'll just, you know, go for walks, go for bike rides, read books, play board games. And it's fantastic. This is actually something we've been doing even since before the, the containment period here. 
Um, and I think that's important to do. I, I think it is a good idea to, you know, we, we're not going to be total Luddites and pretend like, you know, we, we can't access, you know, some good movies and things on streaming services, but we also don't want to be connected to it 24 seven. And that's, that's when I think it gets dangerous. That's when it becomes an addiction, a dependence. And that's really what I was trying to get at mm -hmm. with you are obsolete and sort of what happens when people are walking that line more and more and saying, okay, just a little bit longer. And I'm only watching eight hours a day instead of four hours a day. Well, eight hours is still a lot. So, or, or like you said, with your, your stepkids, when they're, you know, they're on the phone, even while they're watching a movie, that's yeah. going a little far. It's like, Hey guys, we're watching a movie. Why don't you just put the phone down for two hours? You can take a break. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, it's finding that moderation. I think that's important. So totally, obviously. Totally. <laughs> Sunday's, Sunday's my Luddite day. Sunday, I get, I'm up, up before everybody else. Yeah. The TV doesn't go on. Right. I sit with a pile of comic books. Yeah. And I read for fun. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's really important. Um, and, you know, there's, there's more and more research that shows that, uh, that that's important to do for your comprehension, for your understanding, mm -hmm. for your short-term memory. Um, you know, a lot of this new tech, these devices, uh, you know, you go back to the history. When you read enough books about Steve Jobs and and books about the creation of Apple and, and, and just where this all came from. I mean, they were trying to make a lot of this stuff addictive and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the way that it works. And they wanted you to be very, very connected with this technology. And, you know, even over the years, people like Sean Parker from Facebook and Napster and whatnot, he's come out to say, whoops, we made a mistake or whoops, we've gone too far. You see all the time, all these people in Silicon Valley talking about how they do not let their children use, use, use yeah, the devices yeah. and such. So they don't <laughs> want their kids using them because they know how bad it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah, so it's, I, I think, again, it's, it's walking that line. It's finding the moderation. There's obviously some really great, um, you know, technology out there. I mean, this is fantastic. We yeah, can do yeah, this. Totally you know, I, I don't have to fly to England to go and talk to you, see it. Um, yeah, that, that ticket. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we can do this. So, you know, it, it, it is helpful. And, yeah. uh, you know, just like it's nice to have a cigarette every now and then or a cigar or, again, you know, a piece of chocolate cake or whatever. You know, that's one thing, but when you're, you know, chain smoking or when you're having a cigar all day long or whatever, you're, you're eating entire cake, that's when yeah. it gets, that's when it gets yeah. to a bad bubble. You know what I mean? Te so Technology is there to help. It's not there to, you know, yeah, it's, that's the idea it's supposed to be. Right, there. right. No, it's, so, you know, you know what it comes down to real quick is, I think it was Emerson said it or Thoreau. I always mix the two up, obviously. But I think it was Emerson who said, you know, we've become the tool of our tools. Yeah, and yeah. these are great tools. They are. But we uh -huh. need to make sure that they're working for us and not the other way around. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. When, when suddenly, like, we can't stop being on our phones, we can't stop using our tablets, um, when, you know, we're having trouble sleeping, when, we're, when it's screwing up our brains or whatever it is, that's, that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah. So, and we're still navigating it. I mean, this stuff is all still so new. It's so new. You know, we don't even know how this is really affecting us yet. So it's just, it's navigating. Yeah. I, um, I'm a big fan of the Injustice mobile video game on my phone, on my cell mm. phone. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I got in the habit of playing a, a couple of games on the night before I fell asleep. But then if I get beat, my anxiety and adrenaline level yep. would be yeah. Then I'd have to go back it's on the game. It's made like that. It's made I, like they want to go back on the back. game to win yeah. the game back so I could yeah. go, ah, yeah, right. So, yeah. yeah. So, no, it's, 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 it is made like that. That's not conspiracy theory. That's not whatever. And, I, I, you know, video games are fun and so forth and, but, uh, you know, it, it's made to be like that. It's yeah. made to, you, you know, we all know about all these things about how it affects our dopamine levels and everything else. And this, this stuff is real. I mean, it really is real. And so you have to consider it. And again, just like when you're having a hamburger, you're having a cigar or a cigarette or whatever, you know what you're doing is not necessarily the best thing for you. But, you know, if it's relaxing a little bit or you have a few shots of whiskey or whatever, that, you know, it is yeah. what it is. But, you know, you have to know, like, this isn't good for me, but I still yeah. can enjoy a little bit of it. So... Yeah. Which is which is ironic when we talk about technology because um, Lila, Lila goes through the same thing from a physical point of view. Yes. Her, her addictions, I suppose, her issues. Yeah. Um, other aspects of the story before you go that kind of popped into my head. The Logan's Run one is probably prevalent for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but also Miri, the Star Trek episode. I don't know if you watch classic Trek. Captain you know Someone just recently told me about that. I, I, I will admit, I, I, I'm not a, a classic Trek guy. A um, little bit of generation. Really, was really weirdly in a Voyager for some reason when I was a kid. Seven but, nine. Um, There's yeah. no, nothing weird about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but someone just told me about the episode you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I think I have a sense of it, but yeah. So yeah, so basically the beam down to a planet and it's just run by kids. There's no adults. Right. 
And yeah. um, when I started reading the book, that's Logan's run was first. Yuri yeah. came second. Yeah. <clears throat> and then when I was thinking it through, I was kind of like, Justice League, kid stuff. I don't know if you watched the Justice League cartoon. There's an episode no. where they all get shrunk down. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm a really I'm bad geek. Oh, I, I have it. I'm, I'm so bad. I'm such a bad geek. I, I haven't geeked. <laughs> like, I'm different, geek there's things. no such thing as a bad geek. It's just different different slices. Of you know You know what it is, Johnny, really? Seriously, I, I uh, when I was young, I hung around with a lot of much older people. So it really was like, I, I was reading like uh, about George Burns and Phyllis Miller and thing when I was like in fifth or sixth grade, Marx Brothers. And so, okay. like I say, like where, where my geeky credentials are, my sci-fi, I really got into Ray Bradbury very early. Oh, good call. Asimov. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I know it's a little bit later, but Philip K. Dick, I was, I was yeah. so huge into Philip K. Dick. Harlan Ellison, like that was sort of my scene. And, um, you know, so that's, and then of course, you know, like I say, Twilight Zone. Um, so, you know, that's really where I, I gravitated toward for my sci-fi and for, uh, for my, my kind of speculative fiction type stuff. So, you know, that's where I went for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that Village of the Dam really was a big one for yeah. us too. And I think that that's very important. In fact, I started kind of going back and watching some of the other sort of bad children mm -hmm. movies um, you know, obviously The Omen and the, the uh -huh. original Bad Seed. Um, and I've always liked movies like that. There's actually a really great one that I'd highly recommend. It's a bit hard to find, but a friend of mine who runs a film series in Boulder told me about it, and I loved it. It was actually weirdly similar to You Are Obsolete uh, after I'd already started writing it, but it's called Who Can Kill a Child? And it was 1973. It's actually a Spanish film. And it is, it's literally these two people end up on an island <laughs> that is overrun with evil children, and they're basically run. It's almost like a, it's more like Escape from New York or something like that. It's like Escape from New York <laughs> from the Warriors, but like these two people on this island with children. And what's great about it that I really, first of all, it's a fantastic film. I highly recommend it. It's really good. It's scary. They really make the kids evil, like, but in a very like smiley way. Oh, it's 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 pretty scary. But um, almost, one of the things I like about it, and I like this kind of thing. You'll see this in New York obsolete also is I like when it's light out instead of dark out for horror mm -hmm. stories. So like the beginning of Night, Night of the Living Dead or a movie like Carnival of the Souls, obviously. Like I like when it's actually light out. And so they did that very well with Who Can Kill a Child. You're on this beautiful island. It's practically a paradise. It's light out like the entire time. I don't even remember if there's any nighttime uh, scenes. And it's during the day that all these terrible things happen. So it, for some reason, it makes it much scarier and weirder. And again, that goes back to, you've probably seen... Uh, some of my other big influences for the same reason, like The Wicker Man, for example. Yep. I love the way they do that with Wicker yep, Man. Cool. I thought that the, the kid who made Midsummer re uh, recently, this last year, Midsummer, did a fantastic job of that, too. I mean, almost the whole movie, it's, it's light time the mm -hmm. whole time because it is that time of year over there where the, the sun doesn't go down. And it's yeah. still so eerie and scary. It almost makes it scarier that it's never dark. Because it's so I, familiar. You yeah, used, exactly. used to sun equals good. Yeah. <laughs> Night equals bad. <laughs> that, that's actually, that's actually what it, you'll notice even with the covers, um, the third issue where it's Lila and Cad holding hands and then the children are in that line in front of them, um, kind of, uh, you know, barricading them in a way. It is light. It, it, it's the lightest cover. And, it, and literally I told Christina Harrington, my editor, for that, it, that cover, I said, can we do one like during the day? Like I want to do one that really shows like Ooh, there's there's going to be a lot of time in this in this series that's not going to be at night. It's not going to be yeah. dark. We're going to kind of flip it, and so she agreed, and that's why that's one of my favorite covers actually because it is during the daytime, and and it, and it kind of messes with your head the idea of a horror story that's happening, you know, in the afternoon. You know? That makes sense because I mean the kids, right? They've got to have a bedtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I have a feeling those kids are like, going to sleep whenever they want. <laughs> I've let them. It's like fine. You want to stay up? You stay up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, okay, no, so it's it just fun. You are obsolete. Where can people get this book? <laughs> I have no idea. At this point. Right. So the way this I'm works, not lie. <laughs> it was supposed to. So the 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 five the five issues issues one two three four five um, have been out since September. Came out every month September, you know, through January. And then the trade paperback was of all five together. And it really, it, I I have to say, I'm not just saying this. It is stunning. It's so gorgeous. Um, the cover is fantastic the way they did. There's almost a 3D quality to it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a new introduction that I'm, I'm really proud of and I hope people will see and be able to read. I, I think it puts a lot of it in, in perspective. Is that the list? I had a little fun with the intro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, spoiler alert. But I, I had a lot of fun with the intro and I want people to see that. Um, it was supposed to come out, I think, uh, two weeks ago, but they postponed it to, I think, Janu uh, June. Okay. June. 
16th. So I don't know if it's going to be, I don't know. I mean, it's available it's, digitally. Yeah, it'll be available digitally. I think you'll be able to order hard copies of it online okay. through Aftershock and Amazon and all that stuff. Cool. I will say, and, and you even, you and I talked about this before. Um, please, I, if, if people are interested, um, if they've gotten this far in the video, buy the hardcover or buy, buy, buy the hard copy because uh, I just think that, that it's, it's, it's more fun to engage that way and really hold it in your hands. And that's really what I it's agree. supposed to be for. I so, um, you know, if you're getting it through comicology or whatever it is, that's fine. And, and, and that, that's out there also, or will be out there. But I would really highly recommend that people get the, the hard copy because I just think it's such a beautiful book and they yeah. found it really well. It's just, it, it's nice. Look good up, up on your shelf and whatever. So yeah, I think uh, June 16th is when it comes out and either stores will be open or they won't, or I don't know if conventions are happening or, Obviously, a lot of stuff's up in the air right now, but it will. You can order it online as of June sixteenth, and all five issues are already um, out there, and you can order those as well. Cool. So, with uh, social distancing, give your local comic book shops some uh, phone calls, drop them an email, find out when they're open. Yeah. Get on pre-order. That's probably the easiest, quickest way. Yep. To yeah. Yeah. Pre-order. Them. Pre-order. Yeah. Pre-orders. Pre-orders, pre-orders, pre-orders the winner. Right. Yeah. Last question sure. before I let you go for the evening. Um, what's next for you after you are obsolete? Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your asking. Um, I actually, this was my first comic book series. My first uh, children's book comes out uh, through a company called Schiffer Publishing. Um, that comes out in September, the end of September. It's called The Kids of Whitney Junior High Take Over the World. It's actually based on a, um, a group that I worked with for many years in LA and still sometimes work with called The Kids of Whitney High. Uh, they're a group cool. of young adults with developmental disabilities in a rock band. Uh, they were featured prominently in a movie called The Ringer with Johnny Knoxville and Catherine Hegel that the Ferrelli brothers produced a few years back. Um, and they've had a few albums come out, and they've, they've had a lot of supporters over the years, people like Jackson Brown and Mike Patton of Faith No More and Mr. Bungle, Weird Al and Dr. Demento and people like that. So they've got kind of a Daniel Johnson, Wesley Willis thing going on. And I basically put together a book that, um, you know, was sort of inspired by them um, but, you know, age them down to junior high school so it could be more for kids and basically just some adventures that they go on and, and hopefully it'll teach young people about, um, you know, better ways of interacting with people with disabilities and that kind of thing. And we're hoping that'll become a series. This, so this will be the first one. That's available for pre-order online now. Again, it comes out in September. And the book, the actual book, there's a reason to get the hard copy for that one. The actual book will come on the back, a scanner, and you can download three free Kids of Whitney High songs. And there's some other ancillary things in there as well. So that should be fun. Cool. Um, and then I have an audio book. I'm uh, working on uh, audio book originals um, with a woman in Los Angeles named Beth Lapidus. And she kind of helped kickstart the alt comedy scene back in the late 80s. And we're working on an audio book together that's going to come out probably now in January. It was supposed to come out in October, but uh, tentatively it's called So You Must Decide. Um, and then a few other things. You can always find um, a lot of what I'm up to right now on my website, MatthewClickstein.com. That's M-A-T-H-E-W-K-L-I-C-K-S-T-E-I-N. Yes, there is only one T in my first name, Matthew. So uh, long story. But, but yeah, just go to my website. You can find anything and everything there, including some of the other books and things that I've had come out in the last year. So I'm usually doing three or four projects at a time. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, that's, that's probably the best place to find your Matthew Clickstein content is on my website. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so all that's left me to say then, Matthew, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, man. Totally thank appreciate you, it. Thank me you too. for talking about your book. It's a fantastic read. I've read, I've read, I've read it electronically. Sorry, I've read it. <laughs> That's okay. I forgive you. Sorry, um, but it's a great read. Really Thank engaging. You. Some really strong characters in there. So I wish you all the success with that book and, of course, your future endeavors. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Okay. No worries. All that's left for me to say is don't forget to check out the Undercover Capes for all your favorite podcasts, including the Definitive Crusade, the No Prize Podcast, and Flipside Focus where you get all your comic needs met. This is Join the Machine Hughes saying adios. Visit UndercoverCapes.com for the latest and greatest podcasts via the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. Also visit our parent company website, ComicCrusaders.com, all about comic pop culture.